Happy Wednesday, everyone. My name is Yi Ling Zhuang. I'm the Water Resources Regional Specialized Agent in the University of Florida IFAS Extension. Welcome to the Water Wednesdays. Water Wednesdays is a webinar series about Florida's precious resource, water. Every Wednesday afternoon at 2 o'clock Eastern Time, we will live stream a 30-minute talk about Florida's water and what we can do to protect it. We host our webinar series on Zoom and broadcast to Facebook Live. There is a theme for each month. This month is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Month. I will post a link below if you want to learn more about the nine principles of Florida-friendly landscaping. Today, I invited my colleague, the hot culture agent in Lake County, Brooke Moffitt, to tell us how mulch, one of the nine Florida-friendly landscaping principles, can help us save water. So now let's welcome Brooke. Thank you, Elin, for having me. I really appreciate the invitation to be here today. Thank and you. let me go ahead and share my screen. And good afternoon, everyone. While Brooke is sharing the screen and prepare and um, get the presentation ready, I do want to let um, our attendees on Facebook know because this event has um, obtained a lot of interest. So scammers are going crazy now. So they are copying our event and post somewhere else. So they will ask you to click the link and provide your financial information. So if you are our Facebook viewers, please do not click any links that are not posted by the admin. All right, now the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. And I understand we have uh, people from all over the world actually on this talk today. So I feel very honored and privileged to reach you all virtually. Uh, the main focus to, of today is actually going to be using mulch in the landscape. Um, we're gonna discuss a lot of topics specific to Florida Friendly, but I think a lot of these principles will also transfer over to other areas of the world as well. Um, I would like to mention though, you know, please feel free to ask questions, enter them into the chat box and we will field them and I will try my very best to answer them. Um, this isn't really a class that we are gearing towards edibles or vegetable gardens, but we may be still able to answer your questions. But let's go ahead and get started here. So mulching your Florida friendly yard. Again, my name is Brooke Moffis. I'm an extension agent in Lake County, Florida. We are right in the middle of the state. You don't get more centrally located than Lake County. I always like to tell people, you know, where, where I'm from, who we are, what we do. Um, the University of Florida is a way to get research-based information out to the end years, user. So we are the University of Florida IFAS Extension, and we are a partnership with our county as well. And they see us as a public resource, much like parks and trails and library services. So we are here for you, and we provide solutions for your life. That's one of our mottos. All right, so the nine Florida friendly landscaping principles. These are the things that Elin will be discussing on Water Wednesday this month, at least some of these subjects, right plant, right place. If you can do that, you're going to eliminate a lot of your issues right off the bat. Water efficiently, fertilize appropriately. Today we're discussing mulching, and then you can see some of the other topics that we discuss with the nine Florida friendly landscaping principles. So I wanted to open up the presentation with this picture, and this is of one of our master gardeners yards. Uh, one of the very common misconceptions is that an all mulch yard is Florida friendly because you're not using a lot of water, you're not using a lot of pesticides. Now this yard I think is tastefully done. We have a small island of lawn, uh, you know, to give that green overall look. We have some large trees that will fill in nicely and really shade that house. And then we have some plantings mixed in between. But I really think this yard actually needs more plant material. We really don't want to see large expanses of mulch. Um, we want those areas to be planted. So why do we not consider an all mulch yard Florida friendly? Well, it really, if you're getting large nuggets 
uh, for your mulch, large pieces of mulch, it takes them a very long time to break down. At least uh, in Florida, some of that organic matter is just quickly eaten by the microbes. So it does very little actually to build up the soil. Now, this is your larger bark nuggets. We're going to talk about some areas where you can build up the soil with your mulch. And the other thing it does not do is it does not really attract and promote wildlife. So mulch is good. Use that mulch because it's got lots of great benefits, but know that only mulch isn't really considered Florida friendly. You've got to have the plants there and you've got to provide for that wildlife. We're in a biodiversity crisis, so anything that we can do in our state and in our nation and in our world to promote insects, to promote birds and butterflies, you know, it's really going to help all of those species survive. So let's talk about some of the types of mulches. You have organic mulches, and these are your bark, they're your wood chips. Basically, they're just made of once living things. So leaves and pine needles, grass clippings, those could all be considered organic mulch. And in most cases, they will help build your soil over time. But again, the smaller the particle size, the faster they're going to break down, and the actually the more likely you are to get more of a rich organic soil. So one of the organic mulches that breaks down quickly that we really recommend, at least in the state of Florida, uh, because we need the acidity in most of our urban areas, is pine needles. Pine needles does an absolutely beautiful job of um, developing soil quickly. And then if you want to develop that soil quickly, also you could look for uh, pine bark nuggets and you want to get the smallest size possible or other types of wood products in the smallest size possible. Again, if you get the really large um, pieces of bark, it's going to decompose so slowly you're not really going to build the soil. So keep that in mind. I actually have a really funny story. I um, was landscaping my entire front yard, turning it into this big bed with a little island of um, um, uh, native ground cover. But anyway, and I called a landscape company and I said, I want to order 10 cubic yards of the largest mulch nugget that you sell. So they said, okay, I didn't go and look at it. Big mistake, because when they delivered this dump truck, 10 cubic yards is a dump truck full. When they delivered it, the nuggets were this big, I kid you not. And I have had that mulch for 10 years and it's still there. <laughs> it's finally breaking down, but it's done very little to build the soil because I just picked the wrong size. And I was so embarrassed that I had ordered a dump truck of this mulch that I just went ahead with the delivery and used it all these years. So anyhow, that's one advantage to getting the larger sizes, those you don't have to mulch as frequently. So let's talk about those inorganic mulches. Those are going to be your gravel, pebbles, uh, rubber mulch. And I will tell you, rubber mulch, really the only place I think that is um, justified for using rubber mulch is probably like you see here in this application, which is on a playground. And then gravel and pebbles, you know, they're not really going to help build up the soil, but they can give you a um, you know, Japanese or maybe a Chinese or or the kind of that Asian look to the garden with some of those uh, styles of gardening. So that can be very appropriate there. Rock can also be very appropriate if you're putting in a dry stream bed for an interesting feature, or maybe you're even putting them around your utility um, areas like a water softener or your air conditioning unit or something like that. It can be very handy there. But we also, just like we don't want to see an all mulch yard, we also don't want to see an all rock yard either. Because again, that's not going to break down. It's not going to attract wildlife. And I think I see some things coming in on the chat. Do we have some questions coming in, Yilin? Uh, not yet. Okay. All righty. I'll keep continuing on then. All right, so the reason why we are talking about mulching on Water Wednesday is because it's really useful for helping to retain that water. It's going to help suppress weeds and it's going to insulate the roots of your plants as well. So it can help keep them cool in the summer and it can help actually, you know, provide that protection um, and trap heat radiating from the ground at night. So when we get cold, so it really helps insulate those roots. But again, retaining moisture. If you can have a nice three inch layer of mulch, you're really gonna help retain that soil moisture. All right, so application tips is you want to add about a three inch layer. That is one of our Florida friendly landscaping principles is to use a three inch layer of mulch um, and to avoid volcano mulching. And let me get into that there. All right, so the first 
image that you see here is a nice thick layer of pine straw mulch. Actually, it's probably a little bit too heavy. Uh, some of that needs to be pulled away from the base of the plant, but I just wanted to show you one of the common mulches that we use here in this area. And then these are the large pine bark nuggets. These were actually my pine bark nuggets that I purchased, <laughs> the really big ones. So again, they're still there to this day. All right, so volcano mulching. You know, this isn't a huge problem in Florida, but I do see it in some of our Appalachian states. So Tennessee, North Carolina, for some reason, this was a big problem in our urban areas. Not so bad in Florida, but it still happens. So I still need to talk with you all about it. Uh, when you do this, you are actually trapping moisture around the base of that tree or the base of that plant. And all of that growth originates all of the vascular system of that plant where it transports water and nutrients is right underneath the bark. So if that bark is damaged and that vascular system is damaged, you can kill your tree slowly over time. And this usually doesn't kill plants quickly. It's a slow death. And that's where that moisture gets trapped around that bark and that vascular system. Uh, that bark and vascular system sloughs off and then it can no longer conduct water and nutrients. I have seen so many trees die from this, so not good. So they call it volcano mulching. So you wanna keep your mulch away from the base of your trees if you want them to live any length of time. This can also invite pests in and again, promote root rot as well. All right, I wanted to show you this uh, picture. This is from a uh, HOA that I went to and consulted with about their mulching. Um, one of the homeowners contacted me and said, you know, I think that our landscapers just put mulch down every single year because we have it contracted to do so, but we oftentimes don't really need it. So when I went over to his place and kind of went around the neighborhood, uh, that's what I saw as well. Too much mulch. So what they do every year is just add mulch because it's in the contract. Um, and then they end up getting this huge layer of mulch. So his azaleas were dying in the front of the house. You know, and azaleas do like shade, but there might, may have been a little bit too much heavy shade. But when I started digging down, uh, you know, I could not find the topmost root where I eventually did, but it was about four to five, maybe even six inches down. So this, I believe, is about an eight inch trowel there. So it was down around the base and this will kill your trees and shrubs slowly over time. And you can see kind of all the moisture. So there's probably multiple things going on, but the ex excess of mulch around the base of that plant is not doing it any good. So you wanna make sure, I advised that they stop mulching at least these beds. Let's let that mulch decompose some before they start mulching again. Again, and let's push all of the mulch back away from the plants. Um, sometimes it does such a good job of re retaining moisture and then if you have a thick layer again right up next to the base of your plant um, it's going to retain too much moisture and can girdle it. Another thing that dawned on me and this was kind of funny um, I had been landscaping in in central Florida and you know my first house and I went and I bought all these bags of mulch and put it down and as I was putting the mulch down, I was doing this in January, February time period. What started happening? We had this, you know, and feel free to enter it into the chat if you're from Florida and you know what happens to our trees in January and February. And I'm saying our trees, um, I'm what specifically talking about live oaks. Live oaks actually shed their leaves in January, February time period. So I'm putting down all of this fresh mulch and I'm watching all these leaves fall on my fresh mulch and I'm getting upset. I spent all this money for it to look really nice and neat. And then it dawned on me, I should leave the leaves because that is my mulch right there. And that's gonna break down faster and it's really gonna enrich my soil. So this is a, um, this is a, a little statue that I actually found next to the dock in the backyard. And I left him there. I dug him up out of the muck um, after I discovered him. But anyway, so he is sitting right next to the base of my cypress tree. So when my cypress tree loses its leaves right around January time period, I rake them up and I use those leaves as a mulch and it saves me money. They break down quickly, uh, you know, they take about maybe six months to a year to break down and they really enrich the soil. So repurpose your leaves. Another thing I've been known to do is actually go through, 
um, and take bags of leaves off of my neighbor's yard. So they may have like a big bag of oak leaves that they're raked up to get rid of. And I see that as gardener's gold. That is my mulch for one of my beds as nice oak leaves. So anyway, <laughs> I probably shouldn't admit that online where everybody in the world can hear, but I do stealthily go and take those bags of leaves that are just gonna go to waste management. Hopefully I don't get in trouble for that. Anyway, all right, so this is what mulch will look like out there in the store. You know, with our mulches, uh, sometimes they can come with fertilizers in them. Sometimes they can come with pesticides like termitocides. Um, this one actually comes with a pre-emergent herbicide that can help keep some of those weeds from germinating in your landscape. But you'll see cypress mulch is very, it's in you know bulk quantities at a lot of the stores in Central Florida. We actually do not recommend cypress mulch and it's more of an environmental reason because they are actually harvested from a cypress stands. And those are a very important tree for a wetland. So we try to steer people away from the cypress and go more towards um, oak, and pine and you know some other trees. So we wanna uh, keep people away from that cypress. Um, so here's one of the other trees uh, or the other mulches you may find. This probably is going to be specific to Florida. So I'm sorry folks from everywhere else. Um, this is a mulch that we have here, but I don't know, maybe this tree is in your country or your area of the world too, because Melaleuca is a highly, highly invasive tropical tree. And we have it all along our coastal areas. We have it here in Central Florida as well. So someone somewhere thought, I need to take this invasive and turn it into something usable. So they started chipping the Melaleuca mulch um, up. And it is one of the least attractive mulches to termites. It has a slow decomposition rate. Um, and it actually fades to like a light brown color, actually almost a white or a bleached out kind of color. So you do need to know that if you're interested in using Melaleuca mulch, it will bleach out some, but I think it's fine. It makes an excellent mulch. And it's a good environmental story because at least they're doing something usable with these invasive trees. Feel free to type anything in the chat. Uh, you have any questions about mulching, I'll try my very best to answer. All right, pine bark and pine bark needles, or I should say pine bark and pine needles are kind of a go-to mulch for us here in Lake County, here in Discovery Gardens, um, where I work at the Extension Office. Um, it's often a byproduct of the timber industry, readily available, especially through the Southeastern US. Um, eventually, and if you really mulch heavily with those pine needles and do so every six months, um, you can get a really nice soil and it can help lower and acidify the, acidify the soil slightly as well. So again, pine bark is going to decompose slower than the pine needles. And this is where nugget size is really important. You can get something called pine bark fines where the pine bark is almost shredded or you can get a really, really small nugget size and that's going to be a little bit better for building up your soil. But again, it won't last quite so long as the larger nuggets. All right, cypress mulch. Again, we do not recommend this um, because we just don't know the origins can be um, the origins can be difficult to determine. Uh, so again, we don't recommend cypress mulch. If you already have cypress mulch, you know, let it decompose. Um, get another type of mulch material instead and use that. Um, another thing with cypress mulch is it tends to mat. So it will actually form like a very thick mat that water has a hard time penetrating through. So if you get that mat starting to form, take a stiff rake and rake it um, just to break up the matting and continue to use it, you know. Just when you go to mulch again, try to steer away from the cypress mulch. All right, and then rubber mulch. I mentioned earlier, um, you know, my thought is that one of the best places for it is probably a playground. It is a recyclable material, but you definitely do not want to put it around any of your edible plants because you just don't know the composition. You don't know how that could be possibly taken up by your edible plants. And, you know, is there any health implications to that? Well, there very well could be. Uh, I don't know. I haven't seen a lot of research on it. And so until then, I'm going to tell you to use caution using rubber mulch and again only use it in maybe a utility area or a playground type situation so and it's not going to decompose it's not going to of course it's not organic it's not going to build up the soil so gravels pebbles and stones uh, this is also very popular and people in central florida seem to think that this is florida friendly because guess what you don't have to water stone 
well, yeah, you don't have to water stone, but now you're not growing any plants in the area. Nothing is building up the soil. You're not improving the environment for wildlife. So I would recommend, you know, using stone again in small quantities. So what some folks are doing is they're actually replacing their entire yards, ripping everything out, and they're putting only stone in. Do you know what this is going to do to these, the heating, and or I'm sorry, I shouldn't say the heating cost. The cooling cost in Florida, we typically don't have to worry about heating cost in our subtropical environment, but we do have to be concerned about cooling cost. So if everyone in a small neighborhood were to rip out all of their plants, all of their organic mulch and put down, you know, gravels, pebbles or stones, um, I bet they would have a heat island effect from that. So it's just something to consider. And then if you go to plant into that stone, it's a very harsh environment. So you have to have a really, really tough plant. Um, but you know, the, uh, there are some advantages. One is you're not going to attract insects. You're probably not going to attract other forms of wildlife and you know, it's permanent too. So there are some advantages to rock and actually this landscape I think looks pretty nice and it's using, um, you know, a light layer of a pebble or rock type material. So maybe some type of crushed granite. Uh, but here you see it looks nice because you have these ornamental grasses, you have these large limestone features too. So in small quantity and with tough plants, it can be done. All right, so what about termites? We get this question often. Okay, I am mulching and I'm putting down wood that's going to decompose. Is it going to attract termites? Or the other question I get is I bought bags of mulch at the garden center and I think there were term termites in it. So let's talk about the second situation first. All right, with termites, they have to be near their colony and near their queen. Um, and so if you get a bag of mulch that has termites in it, do not panic because if they are away from the colony, which they probably are if, the, if their wood source has been chipped up, um, you know, they are actually going to die out. So they will not survive. They've got to be near their colony. So don't panic if you find termites in a bag of mulch that you just purchased. Uh, but there are some things that you can do because termites can be attracted to your home. And, you know, if we don't handle our moisture and our mulch appropriately. So here's some things to consider. The recommendation from the, I want to call them the termitologist, but there's not really such a thing. They would be our entomologists that specialize in termites. Um, what you would want to, what they would recommend is to go almost three feet or actually right around three feet from a, the base of your house and have nothing but bare ground. So that's not very that may not always be practical for all of us. Um, some of us could do it. And if you can just keep it bare soil, that's the absolute best thing. So sometimes what people will do is they'll put rock in that three foot section um, around. But the termites like to tunnel through that rock. They may not feed on it, but they like to tunnel through it. So we actually recommend bare ground. And if you can't do the three feet, you think, oh my goodness, that's just way too big of a gap to leave around my house. At least do a foot. Do something so that that soil remains dry all the way around the base of your house and you don't have rock mulch and you don't have any other type of mulch uh, for the termites to tunnel through and get to your home. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is you want to keep a nice gap between any siding so you don't want the mulch all the way up to the house and touching your siding because this can be a great way for subterranean termites to get up and underneath your siding. And you know most folks don't have to worry about this but those of us that live in tropical or subtropical environments do have to be concerned about subterranean termites. So in both situations here at least they have some clearance between the mulch and the house. Really that mulch needs to be pushed back a little bit further and then in this situation you have got this mulch right up to this um, brick and that needs to be pushed back and again about a foot if not more of bare soil all the way around your house to make it less appealing. So termites like wood, they like decomposing wood, they like moisture. So the worst situation, oh, these people don't have a good situation in this picture over on the right. They have an irrigation head close to the side of their house with mulch right there. So if that irrigation is, it is actually, you know, it's, oh, let's say the irrigation is over irrigating and that remains moist, that's ringing the dinner bell for those termites. And again, um, from your tree trunks, keep that mulch about a foot away from your tree trunks too, just so that we don't get any of the, that girdling going on that I had mentioned earlier. 
All right, so let's, how much mulch do you need when you do a landscape project? I actually am working to do some begonia trials here at our Discovery Gardens at our UFIFIS Extension Lake County office, and I had to estimate the amount of mulch that we are going to use. So I'm going to uh, attempt to play the sound clip for you, and this is from Tom Wickman, who is our state green industry's best management practices coordinator, and he has a great radio voice. It's only a minute long, so bear with me. Today on Florida Friendly Landscaping in a Minute, calculating mulch. Spreading a three inch deep layer of mulch in your landscape beds is a Florida friendly way to control weeds and save water. But how do you know how much mulch to buy? Garden centers typically sell mulch in bags that hold two to three cubic feet, but bulk deliveries trucked to your house are measured in cubic yards. For a quick rule of thumb, each cubic foot of mulch will cover four square feet of your landscape, while a cubic yard will cover 108 square feet. Measure your landscape's length and width to estimate its square footage and convert that to the number of bags or cubic yards of mulch you'll need. It's that easy. For more information about mulch and many other landscaping topics, contact your county extension office or visit FFLMinute.com. Florida Friendly Landscaping in a Minute is a production of the University of Florida IFAS Extension's Florida Friendly Landscaping Program and WFTFM in cooperation with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Okay, thank you, Tom. So just to recap, um, you know, a cubic foot of mulch is going to cover about four square feet in your yard, and a cubic yard will cover about 108 square feet. So you can figure out roughly about how much square footage that you have, and then you can go from there to try to determine the amount of mulch that you need for your landscape project. So there's actually formulas online, and I actually have to say um, Texas A&M, another university uh, in the southeastern U.S., has a really good publication on calculating mulch. So just type in calculating mulch into your web browser, but I'm going to give you a little cheat that you can do to find university information doesn't have to be University of Florida. We would love it to all be University of Florida, but if Texas A&M has a good publication on it, why not, you know, send you that way. So you're going to type in calculating mulch, and then you're going to type in the word site, S-I-T-E colon dot E-D-U. You can do this with any search engine. If you want to search for roses, if you want to search for palms, if you want to search for vegetable gardening, just do vegetable gardening, site colon Dot edu and that's telling your web browser to only give you sites ending in dot edu so you can cut through all the garbage that's out there on the internet and get to an educational resource oops okay thank you tom we don't want to do that again though all right so i thought this was also interesting uh the same hoa that you know i told you i went to and um you know they were just kept putting out mulch just because it was in the contract um you know, they asked me, how long will mulch last in Florida? And I actually found some research on it. So you can see we have the depth of the mulch on the vertical axis over here on this chart. And then we have the time since the experiment began on the horizontal axis on this chart. Um, so it went from, they started evaluating the mulch subsidence, I guess you could say, or the mulch settling at the three month mark after application and then two years after application. So in the white bar, we have the cypress and this kind of, um, I don't even know what you call it, crisscross pattern, we have eucalyptus. The black is regional utility mulch. The checker pattern is melaleuca. The dots are pine bark and the stripes are pine straw. So check this out, after 24 months, two years, there was very little settling of mulch that actually occurred. So this HOA was, you know, mulching every single year. And, you know, after I talked to him, I said, you know, I really think you can get by if you do that thick three inch layer every year, you can get by mulching once every two years. And this was able to, um, one of the gentlemen from the HOA said, hey, you actually just saved us $24,000 every other year by that little piece of information. But that's research. So, and I actually had it to prove it. Um, this is actually from the University of Florida. Uh, so anyhow, but check it out. The one that um, settled the most, I guess you could say, or decomposed the most was that pine straw. I bet in this situation, the soil was actually more rich, more enhanced because of that fast decomposition and that fast breakdown of the pine straw. But anyhow, you can see with the 
other mulches, the melaleuca, the utility mulch, eucalyptus and cypress, they all hung in there for about two, at least two years. So you don't have to mulch every single year and just because your neighbor's doing it. The other thing I want to mention to you is utility mulch. You can use utility mulch. Um, sometimes you can get it free from public agencies or free from arborists that don't want to have to pay to dump it at a waste management site. Um, you know, and oftentimes the waste management site will make um, compost or uh, maybe even give or sell wood chips and that type of thing. But you could actually be a dump site for an arborist if you wanted to. Uh, but what I will tell you about the utility mulch is that you need to be careful because sometimes they're just grinding up vines, they're grinding up invasive species. Um, so I always like if we're going to get a, um, you know, a big uh, shipment, I guess you could say, of utility mulch in or a big truck full, I get up in the back of the truck, I check it out, and I want to see that it's mostly oak, maybe some pine, um, and I don't want to see any vines in it or any debris. So what I like to do, and I'll, I'll just tell them, don't send me the garbage, send me the stuff that's, you know, got the pine or the oak, and that's all I want. I'm not going to take it if it has any other types of debris in it. And that's actually been pretty good for our Discovery Gardens here. Uh, but that's if you're going to have a really large landscape project that you would even want to consider really using that utility mulch because they will bring it by the 10 cubic yard dr dump truck full. So, all right, so what questions do we have? Here's the, my contact information if you want any more information about mulch. Um, we had some questions that were actually uh, emailed to us, you know, uh, uh, before the talk began and folks wanted to know about synthetic mulches. I think I touched on the rubber mulch. Um, and if you're looking at more of a food production type situation with vegetables, you might be referring to these uh, plastics that they put down over rows when they're growing row crops. And so those can be used, uh, of course, you know, in the summertime here in Central Florida, you'd probably want to use a white or maybe even a reflective type plastic mulch uh, to actually, you know, uh, help reflect some of that heat. And then in the wintertime, oftentimes our growers will use a black plastic mulch to help absorb some of that heat. Uh, that's just, you know, one little tidbit there. Um, as far as the landscape fabric, people will ask me, should I use the black plastic and put my mulch down on top of that? If you want to use some of the landscape fabrics, make sure it is like a woven material and that it is not the black plastic uh, because that black plastic will break down very, very quickly and it can actually be quite a mess. So, you know, it's your choice whether you want to use some type of synthetic um, weed barrier you know, there's no, we don't have hard and fast data saying whether or not or to do it. I will tell you that in my front yard, I want it to look a little more landscaped than I do my backyard. So I did put a weed barrier down, a woven weed barrier, and it's lasted me quite a long time. In the backyard, I want more of a garden type look for plants to fill in more. So I decided not to do the weed barrier. Uh, at first, the weed barrier really helps me with my weeding and I did not have to weed near as much in the front yard. Um, but now that weed barrier is starting to break down a little bit and it's the plants, the roots are getting all woven into the fabric and it's a real pain. So it can give you some years of grace as far as um, weeding goes, but then it can end up being a pain later on. So it's just your decision whether or not you want to do a weed mat or a weed barrier. I would just encourage you to stay away from the cheap plastic weed barrier. You get what you pay for as far as weed barrier goes. All right, so what questions do we have, Yilin? All right, thank you, Brooke, for this informative presentation. We have uh, several questions here. Um, let me start from the beginning. Okay, so sure. one question is, is it true that if you use cedar mulch, that will keep aphids away from the plants? You know, I have to say, I don't know about aphids specifically, but, you know, one of the things that that mulch could, I mean, you know, it might be possible there may be some aromatic or some oils in that mulch that might help repel insects. I have not seen research on cedar specifically. Melaleuca does uh, help to repel termites, or at least it's one of the least attractive mulches, and that kind of has uh, aromatics as well, so some of those um, oils and such. Now, as far as um, mulching, repelling pest, 
So like I was saying earlier, it can bring in termites if you have a water situation and you're not keeping it away from the foundation of your home, but it can be good for helping to minimize the amount of possibly fungal or bacterial problems you have. Because when water, either through rainfall or through irrigation, hits that bare soil and say that bare soil has a spore or some type of mold, that water can then splash up onto the plants and you know it could spread. So if you can put a nice uh, layer of mulch down, then that can actually help with that rainfall and avoid the splashing. So that's one area where that can help. All right. Um, then another question is, can I use sand or straw or hay? Oh, sure. Yeah, you absolutely could. Um, yeah, anything really that would, you know, form some type of barrier there. Now, we actually have our Southwest Garden here at Discovery Gardens. Like I said, we're right in the middle of Central Florida, uh, but we use sand for mulch. But I will tell you, we have to weed it, weed it, weed it, weed it. So that's one of my favorite things about using a really nice layer of mulch is to help minimize the weeds. But yeah, you could do a straw. I, I don't see any issue with that. Uh, but I would just, you know, um, no smoking, no cigarette smoking around that straw. I could see that stuff going up really easy. You may not want to use it near your home, you know, a, a building or something like that, just in case the bazaar happens. You know, and, and I'm not sure what area of the world you're, you're, you know, coming from, but in Central Florida, we are a longleaf pine, or at least historically, we were a longleaf pine forest, and we are supposed to get wildfires. So that is a consideration for you. I have to <laughs> just share this piece because we just bought a new house and along when we inspect the house, uh, um, just along the foundation, <laughs> we did see about an inch wide of cigarette butts. Of uh, what was it, Elin? <laughs> we saw one inch wide of cigarette butts. <laughs> Oh, oh, gotcha. Mm, I don't know if they were using that as motion. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because yeah. your comment that just to me <laughs> sounds quite funny. Oh my goodness. So she had a one inch layer of cigarette butts around her yeah, house. It was the... How lovely. You never know what those construction workers are doing while your house is being built. And sometimes that can actually give us some problematic soils because sometimes they just bury their debris in your yard. And then you're left with this yard that has construction debris or cigarette butts in it. So, okay, what other questions do we have? Um, something it's also related to leaves. Can I use a large palm leaves? Large palm leaves? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would actually probably chip those or cut those up. With your mulches, you really want no more than well, you know, it depends what you want to, but about three inches, I wouldn't go much more than that. Or you might end up in a situation where it, my situation where I've had the same mulch for 10 years, which in a way is nice. Again, I haven't had to replace it, but it's also not building up the soil either. So I would say to keep it about three inch pieces, if at all possible, you could go up to four, go up to five. No one's going to come out there with a ruler, but um, you could try it. Why not? Sounds great. And then how about uh, fresh cut uh, grass clippings? Or you want to wait? Okay, so fresh cut grass clippings. You could use that. Now, I will just say that if there are weeds in your grass, you want to compost those and you want to get that compost pile really hot and you would not want to use it as a mulch. But if you have pretty much a monoculture of grass, you know, and you don't have a lot of weed competition, you could use that as a mulch, sure. Now right. it's going to decompose quickly. You know, actually when you're, if you were to use the palm leaves and you were, you, you were to use that fresh cut grass, what you're actually doing is something called sheet composting, where you're just basically layering uh, your compost or your compostable material right over the soil. And that's kind of what mulching is in a way. It's sheet composting. So anyhow. And if you want to know more about composting, please turn in next week because next week is composting for a water-wise uh, landscape. All right. And if we move on and I have uh, more questions here, how could organic mulch help the soil if the soil is mostly clay? except for the first two inch um, of the regular soil. Okay, so, you know, composting, anytime you can add organic compost or your mulches, they, that organic matter is a miracle worker. It will really help build up 
sandy soils, which is most of what we have to deal with here, but it really can help break down and emulsify those clay soils too. So it it will help build up. Um, you know, actually I'm from rural Tennessee and my parents live on this ridge um, in the Sequatchie Valley, but anyway, um, a funny name there, uh, but that was all clay and all rock. And we started adding um, a compost pile and food scraps. And then I started doing a lot of grass clippings actually, which someone suggested earlier, a lot of grass clippings. And we ended up breaking down that clay soil eventually and I could garden in it, but it took years. It took years of staying on top of it and adding compost and adding clippings to it. And we really did have a beautiful dark workable soil. But when we first moved there, it was, you couldn't even get a foot down into that soil. It was just this really thick clay. That's great. Then how about synthetic mulch, like rubber or plastic mulch? Will they contribute to soil um, pollution to the soil and the water? It could be. And, you know, I have to admit, I don't know the data on it, uh, truly. It may be something where we could find some research out there and, and I could do some searching around if you want to stick your email in the chat box. I could see what I could find for you. Um, but I would say since we don't know, it's probably best to proceed with caution. So like I said, the rubber mulch, we, you know, you've got all kinds of petroleum and different compounds in those tires. I would use them for walkways. I would use them for playgrounds, but I would not, again, use them for edibles or mm -hmm. most of my landscaping. Um, so I hope that answers your question a little bit. It's kind of an area I'm not real knowledgeable on, quite honestly, but I can try to find out more for you. That would be great. Thank you, Brooke. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, there's another question. So you said we want to avoid the volcano mulch. Then how far, uh, question moved. So how far away we want to keep the mulch away from the trunk of the tree? Okay, so I would say at least a foot. Try to keep it away from the trunk of the tree by at least a foot there. Um, and then sometimes if you're mulching heavily your beds, sometimes that mulch can kind of slide in there. It's okay if there's maybe a little one inch layer, not a big deal, but you just don't want to mound it up. And I don't know why folks do this, um, why they think it's a good idea. Uh, it's just, you know, beyond me and beyond a lot of folks in horticulture, we all know that that's a bad thing to do, but for some reason people still do it. So yeah, just keep it a foot away. And again, you wanna do a three inch layer around your entire landscape bed. And again, come up to your tree, but not, you know, keep a little bit of space. You just don't want the bark touching the trunk. Great. Um, what are your thoughts on mulch and the breeding mosquitoes? I find anywhere I put mulch instead of just using leaves, uh, trimmings, uh, it is loaded with them. Mm, you know, I'm thinking you probably have a moisture problem um, or that soil's just not allowed to dry out. It could be that you are in an area where, um, you know, you have a waterlogged soil or something like that, because I, I rarely experience that. Um, so I think there's some other type of water issue going on. You know, it could be possible. Um, you know, that you could be irrigating too much too. I know no one ever wants to hear that, right? Never, no one ever wants to hear that they're watering or irrigating too much, but you may want to consider that. So it could be that you have clay, a clay base and water's not draining pop properly, or it could be that there's too much irrigation, um, or maybe there's way too thick of a layer of mulch. I kind of saw that with that HOA that I was telling you about. I would go up to the houses and check out all their declining plants and pull it back. And there was so much moisture because there's way too much uh, mulch, too thick of a layer. So too thick of a layer, um, you know, water already logged in your soil or possible too much irrigation. Those would be my guesses anyhow. Um, just a follow up to that question, attendee just uh, commented uh, she lives in South Florida and she never irrigates. Oh, you know, if you really put a nice thick organic layer of mulch down, you know, again, no more than three inches or you can get into some plant health issues, but, you know, and you keep that down, you select Florida friendly plants or I shouldn't just say Florida friendly plants, really. You select the right plant for the right place. You really think about your plant selection. I rarely irrigate my yard. Um, I do go out and hand water in times of a severe drought, but that's about it. You know, um, I can't say that I have the most pristine landscape though either, <laughs> you know, but I think, you know, in Florida, 
at least in Central Florida, we really need our irrigation in April and May when we are almost always dry, not always, but almost always dry those months. And I think through the rest of the year, we really don't need to irrigate that much. So right plant selection, use that mulch to help retain moisture and you really don't have to irrigate throughout the entire year. Especially right now, uh, you know, it's January. And so our turf grass, the growth is slowed down, our landscape beds, our plants, the growth is slowed down. We do not need to be watering really right now um, unless we just get really, really droughty. And you know, I say that and actually in Lake County, we are kind of droughty right now. So, you know, an irrigation cycle here or there, but not even weekly, maybe every two, every three weeks we could do one irrigation and be fine so you know you really can cut your water down this time of year yeah that's great because some uh, winter time for it winter time you should say you skip a week um for that south florida i'm not sure how about king tides uh, play into the role there might be some water logging issues because i've been hearing a lot of flooding in south florida so that's, I'm just curious uh, it's, if it's just recently, like whenever you put mulch, you have mosquito issues. I mean, if it just recently or it's been like that. So I just think it's, uh, it's quite interesting. But I agree with the book just said, uh, you, you have mosquitoes, so oftentimes it's just too much water. They need, uh, they need their food, they need their, their source to, um, to live on. Yeah, yeah if you would like to hear to more info, please just leave in the comment session. Uh, we will follow up. And something else, it just moved really quick. I think one attendee commented, uh, um, the attendee lives in New Jersey and they use the paper, like newspaper. Oh, and yeah, pasta. okay. And it's really good uh, to uh, suppress weeding. So you know what? I'm glad you said that because remember how I was telling you all that the front yard, I used like a woven weed barrier. I spent some money on it. I bought, you know, a, a heavy duty weed barrier. And then in the backyard, I decided not to do the weed barrier and I did newspaper. I did a layer of newspaper. Um, I will admit that I did use an, uh, I lined my beds. I took a hose and I made the pattern of how I want the bed to look. And then I took spray paint and spray painted that pattern out and then I sprayed herbicide where I wanted the landscape bed to go and then I the front yard I spent all this time tilling and pulling out and I you know killed my back doing that and in the backyard I just herbicide it then I put the newspaper down in the mulch and then you know a few weeks after that I planted I will do that every single time now let me tell you so that's a good tip I love it yes Work, work smarter, not harder. <laughs> <laughs> right. We all love that. Um, it moved again, but I think I saw something. It's about lemongrass. How about using lemongrass leaves as mulch? I have no idea. You've got me on that one. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I do use it in my Thai food. I actually just used some lemongrass this week. <laughs> I'm not sure about mulch, though. You know, it, could there be some repellency? There could. Um, has it been researched? I don't know. So, but you know, I would say if you want to try it, I don't think it would be anything that would probably be toxic to your plants. Um, you know, again, cut it maybe into three inch pieces and try using it. You know, and I find with mulching, we can really use a lot of our leaf materials and a lot of our yard waste as mulch if we're consistent with the size. If we're not consistent with the size, it can look messy. So I think if we're consistent with the size as far as how we chop up our pieces, then I say go for it, try it, why not? Right, I love it. Um, another question is uh, regarding the thickness. Is the thickness of three inch layer enough to attract and feed earthworms too and develop the soil at the same time? Hmm, I would think it, I would think it would because you know it's enough to help retain moisture for the plants too. Uh, again, that's kind of get, getting into you guys are hitting all the areas I'm like I don't really know about that but let me get back to you kind of thing. Um, but you know I would think as long as it was holding some of that moisture I'd really work on adding organic matter though so if I was wanting to 
bring in earthworms, I would probably use a lot of leaf material that I have in my own yard. You know, like in my instance, I have um, some large live oaks and cypress trees, and I would be using that as my mulch and just freshening it up every time those leaves fall, which with the cypress and the oak, they only fall once a year, and it's this time right now. But I have found that if I do a thick enough layer of the oak leaves and the cypress leaves, um, and I do them in separate beds. I do all my cypress in one bed and then I do my oak leaves in, in a separate bed. But, you know, if I do a thick enough layer, it will last me barely until that next year. But I think uh, that would be the way I would go if I was trying to attract earthworms, things that would break down quickly. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brooke, for the oh, informative welcome. presentation. And uh, we have more questions coming up. Uh, so if you have more questions, feel free to leave on the comment session. And if you have, uh, you can also email Brooke or email me later if you have more questions coming up. Um, I want to bring this comment up. And like I said, it keeps moving. So mm -hmm. this is, uh, we have one attendee, it's overseas and wondering about uh, the PhD program, especially like soil science. So if you are interested in joining UF, please check our admin, uh, admission. So you can check the department and look at the faculty, see if you can find any interest, uh, any studies uh, you are interested. Uh, meanwhile, um, he also have a he also has a question. It's about uh, like inexpensive motion because uh, like what's your suggestion? What's the most economically and also environmental friendly mulch? Mm, so I would say, you know, any of that utility mulch you could get your hands on because again, you're using a waste product and oftentimes it's free because people don't want to pay to have to dump it um, at, a, at a waste management or landfill or something like that. Also, I would suggest, um, you know, like what I was describing a moment ago as far as using what you actually already have on your property. So if you have oak or you have, um, you know, cy or whatever type of trees that you have. Um, so those, you know, as long as they don't have some type of property that would be harmful for plant, um, you know, because there are some trees that can actually impede uh, other plants growth. So you would just want to check that. So, and I'm happy to research that for you. Like if there's certain trees that you have on your property, you can always give me a list and shoot me an email and I'll see if I can find it out for you. Who knows? It may not have been researched, but you never know. Sometimes the research is out there. So, uh, but I would say to use what you have on hand and then also, um, you know, compost. I like to compost my yard waste and my kitchen waste and it has amazed me me once I really I've, I've you know I can't say that I'm the best at this but I've started to eat much healthier over the past two or three years and I'm eating a lot more fresh fruits and veggies and once I started eating a lot more fresh fruits and veggies the health of my compost improved because I was constantly adding lots of green fresh material to it and it's so funny because it was like a light bulb went off and I thought oh if I eat healthy then I'm contributing to my beautiful compost pile that's helping for soil health and for my landscape health and it's you know not to get too cheesy but it's all interconnected our health the planet's health you know our yards health our gardening health our gardens health you know so it's all interconnected so um you know and i actually complained one time to one of my master gardeners that it was a really good vegetable garden and I told him, I said, you know, I don't understand my compost pile. I just can't make enough compost. And whenever I add something, it breaks down so quickly that it's just back to sand. And I was so frustrated. And he said, you know what, Brooke, it's your diet. And I said, what? He said, yeah, it is your diet. You have to change your diet and quit eating all that processed food. And <laughs> start, okay, I'm getting on a soapbox. Elon, rein me back in. I'm getting crazy over here. Oh, okay, it's well. all good. Yeah. Actually, it's all good information. Um, and I love you brought that up again. It's composting because just like you said, everything is interconnected. So right. what you eat will contribute to your compost pile and the, the good your compost is, the better your soil will be. So I'm, I'm very glad you brought that up because it's a perfect ending for today's talk and I remind all of you here next week we'll give you some tips how you can do um, how composting can help your yard so thank you again Brooke for this informative presentations and answering all the questions um, before
before I let everyone go, I will appreciate if you can take the survey for us. I just post the link here. Um, so if you can go to this survey, let me see, it's bit.ly water wet eval. So if you can go to that link, take the survey and tell us how what you have learned and how we can improve this series, we will really um, appreciate that. With that, I thank you for your time and you all enjoy the rest of your day and I'll see you next Wednesday. Bye now. Bye everyone. Thank you for tuning in.